You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Good afternoon, and thank you for tuning in to WCAT Radio's Vows, Vocations, and Promises, Discerning the Call of Love. I am your host, Dr. Marianne Arrakis. On today's episode, I have the privilege of speaking with Mr. Dan Almater regarding his chapter in the new book entitled Spiritual Husbands, Spiritual Fathers, Priestly Formation for the 21st Century, a book that is edited by Bishop Felice uh, Estevez and Bishop Andrew Cousins and has been published by Holy Apostles College and Seminaries and Route Books and Media. Before we launch into today's program, let us begin, as we always do, with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear God in heaven, from all eternity, you have willed to reveal to us the depths of your love. In creating humanity to bear your own image and likeness, you have bestowed upon us an immeasurable gift. Please help each of us to prayerfully discern the unique vocational path upon which you invite us to embark. Help us to tune out the din of distractions and listen for the gentle sound of your call. Grant us the courage to view ourselves and others through your eyes, focusing not on limitations and failures, but rather on the abyss of your divine and merciful love. Teach us to hope in your promise and to answer your call with boundless trust. Remain with us always as we seek only to do your will. We ask this through the intercession of Our Lady, the all-pure and ever-immaculate Virgin Mary, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Once again, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Vows, Vocations, and Promises, Discerning the Call of Love. Today I have the privilege of discussing the new book entitled Spiritual Husbands, Spiritual Fathers, Priestly Formation in the 21st Century, with one of its contributing authors. Mr. Dan Almater, regarding his contribution, Chapter 12, entitled A Testimonial and Some Pastoral Wisdom. Dan holds a master's degree in counseling from Augusta University. He is a licensed professional counselor, an educator, a published author, a sought-after international speaker. Dan is also the longtime leader of the Alleluia community in Augusta, Georgia, a community that has been blessed Uh, by the Holy Spirit, and produced over 15 vocations to the ministerial priesthood and religious life. Dan's own background includes six years of seminary formation. Dan travels nationally and international speaking, primarily on three uh, topics, growing deeper in prayer, ecumenism, and the truth about same-sex attraction. Dan's book, Unity on Earth as in Heaven, has been translated and published in Polish. Welcome, Dan. I am delighted that you were able to join me here today on WCAT Radio's Vows, Vocations, and Promises, Discerning the Call of Love. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much. It's a real honor and privilege to be here, and I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to share. I'm delighted to have you here. This book is phenomenal. I had the privilege uh, um, of interviewing two of the managing editors, um, Father Horn and Deacon uh, Thomas Polico, um, previously. And this is a really exciting new book um, uh, edited by Bishop uh, Estevez and Bishop Cousins. Um, Everybody that's been pulled together for this project has such expertise. Um, It is uh, really a privilege to be able to bring this book and its authors to my audience. Um, Could you tell the audience a bit about yourself? Well, I'd be glad to. Um, First of all, just being part of this book project was quite an honor and surprise. I I felt a little bit out of my league when I saw some of the people contributing to it um, because I'm, I'm just, I'm, quote, a lay person who, um, I mean, I have some expertise, but uh, I as uh, but as uh, as I put it together, um, I, I think the Lord well, the Lord put it together, and uh, He just made it happen. But uh, um, what my story it, it's in the chapter very briefly. I, I grew up um, in a very traditional Catholic family. I would call it the model Catholic family. 
Um, we had clergy over all the time for dinner, and and we went to mass regularly. Confession every two weeks. Um, my father was a, a dairy farmer. Um, I was an altar boy. I'm one of ten children, and um, life was pure Catholic growing up, um, and and really very a very a pretty good life. I had I had some issues. Uh, however, uh, we, my entire family had an um, encounter with Jesus, a personal encounter through the Charismatic Renewal in 1970, and uh, we were all baptized in the Holy Spirit, and this put our whole family on a new t- trajectory. Um, there was five already married in the family, and five who weren't, and three of us five all went into vocations. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, wow. we went into priestly vocations or, uh, or went that direction. Uh, as it turned out, I, I didn't stay in the seminary, um, which is a lot of my story uh, of this book. I, I didn't stay. And the truth was, uh, I said in the book that God led me out, but I actually had an... <laughs> Haven't have it, had it since, but this was over 40 years ago. I had an audible voice from the Lord when I was trying to decide whether to stay in the community, uh, to to stay in the seminary and become a priest, because I was getting very close to ordination, uh, wow. or come and join this community that I'm now a leader in. Um, the Lord spoke audibly right as I was receiving the Eucharist, and He said, wow. "The choice is yours." But you will do more to build my church if you go to the Alleluia community than if you stay here to become a priest. Well, I mean, he's, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I, I almost collapsed right there in the aisle, and, and I sobbed for about 30 minutes. And then I got up, and I, that was my answer. Because if I could do more for God as a layperson in, in this community, um, then that's where I was going. So I went to my spiritual director. He confirmed my decision. And the next day I left, and that was, that's how I ended up in Georgia. Ended up meeting my wow. wife here, and we got married. We have six awesome children. They're all, ra- uh, all very vibrant Catholic, married to Catholics, and I have 17 grandchildren now. So that's life is incredible. good, and God has been very good to me. That is incredible. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, it must have been an incredibly difficult decision and one that you were weighing for some time um, to have gotten to that point, close to ordination, six years in, in formation. And it, it was a very, it was probably the most difficult situa- uh, decision in my life because I was, I, I was convinced God wanted me to be a priest. But I had spent a summer in this community as a chaplain, and uh, I fell in love with it. And, um, and I didn't want to go back, and, but I knew I had to go back because God wanted me to be a priest. <laughs> so right. that I, was, I was really, and most of my uh, priests and uh, other seminarians said, something's wrong with you, you're not your usual self. And I was really trying to discern. I didn't want to disobey God. I thought of his will was to, to stay there and um, be the priest be a priest. And when he told me the choice was mine, but I could do more for him here, that was, that was, you can't imagine how liberating that was. And um, you've hit on on a major theme of this, this program, this series of programs. And as much as I want to get into your chapter, um, your discernment story is so very important, one, to who you are and the chapter, but also to the listeners of this program. Um, the Vows, Vocations, and Promises, Discerning the Call of Love. There's so much that I'd love to unpack in your story so far. Uh, I hear from those who are discerning just how difficult it is to make decisions and how they are committed to God's call wherever that call leads them. And you answered so beautifully. Uh, you know, not everybody gets that voice at no, the, I, during that's communion. What, I say. what a gift. I guess God knew how weak I was. <laughs> I needed an audible <laughs> voice. It's terrible. But that's how he loved, he loved me so much he did that, you know. So. Uh, I mean, that's an enormous gift to have made. But even with that voice, it couldn't have been an easy decision. 
Well, no, I mean, I still, I mean, for, for, you know, I still had deep relationships with those people, uh, with, with right. priests. And I have a real affinity for priests. I, I, one of the, again, one of the beautiful things, uh, God's fulfillment of that word to me was that I could do more to build the church if I left. And I didn't understand that. But yeah. after I came here to this community, not too much, several years later, we formed a, a Catholic fellow, uh, fellowship with the diocese. And, and before you know it, um, priests and, and, and sisters were being formed. I mean, just, just this month, June, uh, well, just yesterday, uh, Pentecost vigil, one of our guys got ordained a priest for the CFRs, and another one's getting ordained uh, in two weeks for our diocese. I mean, we, wow. we have been blessed with numerous vocations, uh, both to priesthood and um, to religious life. And, and, uh, and, of course, we're an ecumenical community. People can't figure this out. How can you be a community full of Protestants and Orthodox and Messianic Jews and Pentecostals? <laughs> Catholics and have this kind of uh, uh, vocations, but it's happening. Wow, that is a phenomenal, phenomenal story. Um, once you were in the, in your new surroundings and there at uh, at the community, did you ever look back? Um, did you feel like you had made the right decision from the very beginning? And did God give you the grace? to confirm that within you or did you um, question every once in a while i i'll, I'll i think the f maybe one after the first year thing i had a hard time finding work that kind of stuff i was i literally felt like the uh, the enemy was tempting me with if you just go back sure. i'll do you great things for you that, but I recognize that almost instantly is, is, uh, is that. But quite honestly, I have never, I think the call, the call was so strong and, and it was so sure. I, I have never really seriously ever doubted it. And to be honest, it, this community, which is maybe about 700 people, um, we, we, make a, we make a life commitment um, so it's, it's as close to religious life as you could possibly imagine, but without, um, without, it's not a celibate community, although we have probably 15 priests who are members, but they're not the leaders. They're, it's a lay-led community. So it's, it, when, I, when I made that commitment, it was for life. So I'm, it's like living a, a modern-day religious life for, for me. And so I, I really feel like I've kind of almost got a little bit of the best kind of a religious life, but it's, it's a lay life and it's a normal life. We, live, we work in the world, but we live in community together and we uh, serve, our, serve our parishes and, and are very active in our diocese. So. As a secular Carmelite, I can understand the living in the world and being part of a, a religious uh, community. Yes, um, yes. And... I have had others say to me the same thing, that once the decision was made, whether it was the decision to leave, the decision to go in, you know, each one of these beautiful vocations that we've been discussing here on this program, consecrated virginity, um, uh, ministerial priesthood, religious life, generous single life, um, every one of these, I have had folks tell me that Yes, they felt that the choice was theirs, and they knew that they could go one way or another. And that really speaks to freedom um, yes. and how God really does give us a free will, and he respects that free will. Um, and that if one feels that their free will is not being respected and that they have no choice, it's not from God. Yes. Um, <laughs> that was how I almost knew it was God, because... Uh, his voice, because I would never, I really would never have thought to say that <laughs> to myself. I mean, it never occurred to me that I, I had a free choice. I mean, I knew I had a free choice, but for God to tell me, it, you know, you can choose either one. I know he wasn't going to condemn me either way. He wasn't going to, he just said, you could do more for me if you do this, but I'll, I'll right. bless you if you do the other, but <laughs> you know. I think there's something really 
amazing about that, that God would think that way <laughs> or say that, you know. Theologically, it's everything we know to be true, but when you actually experience it in that sense, it confirms everything that, you yeah. know, that you've been taught in the books, everything that you've been taught theologically, um, feeling that free will and, and knowing what a gift it is, feeling it resonate deeply within you um, is, is so very important and such a gift. Um, yeah. I've told others that when they feel that God does not, God does not push. He may propel, he will support, um, he will call, he will invite. But if you feel you are backed into a corner and that there is only one path and only one decision you must make, it's not from God. Um, And for you to have that experience that so beautifully demonstrates it, a rare experience to hear his voice uh, and to make it so perfectly plain is, is something I really wanted to highlight. That is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Um, that's actually that piece isn't in my chapter because I, it would have been I could have written a whole chapter on that alone, but I, I just kind of glossed over the fact that I left seminary and came here. But, um, when anyway. you were in seminary, you had some, as the chapter says, you had some pretty pretty profound growth that needed to be accomplished, um, right. and some things that you struggled with. Um, could you share? that experience with the listeners? Well, I, I think when I had my encounter with, with the Lord, I was between my junior and senior year in high school, and immediately I just wanted to go and do, reach as many people to talk about the Lord. And so seminary, being a priest, I think that's the way to do it. And, but when I, when I got into the seminary, I had, I had the spiritual a counter with the Lord, but I didn't realize how wounded I was from my, uh, from things that had happened in my, in my family. Um, mostly, um, and again, I, I think at least this was my perception. Uh, I had a, a really, a, a pretty negative relationship with my dad. Um, and, um, and it, I would say no relationship growing up uh, to speak of and to the point where I just um, he he didn't uh, I just had nothing to do with him much and he didn't have much to do with me I'm I was the ninth of the ten children I have five older brothers and so uh, and we had the typical pick on each other um, fighting arguing I mean we loved each other but I suffered from horrible self-esteem issues. And, um, and on top of that, all my brothers were somewhat athletic and gifted in the areas of, um, oh, I don't know, things like carpentry, plumbing, electrical, um, just all those kinds of trades. I, I had none of that. I was born and on with a dairy none of it. Farm and on a dairy way. farm. Uh, I mean, I worked hard. I got up at 5 a.m. to milk the cows, but anybody can milk a cow. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't fix this or that. And, and, and so I, I, you know, I just felt inferior. I felt like I didn't quite fit as, as, as a guy in, in, in this sure. family. Um, now, I, I had a, it was, everything seemed normal. I mean, in high school, I dated girls. And, and um, in fact, um, I, you know, so the, the chapter in the book is, has to do with same sex attraction and, and whether, you know, what should you do with somebody who comes to the seminary who is same sex attracted? I, this is, I wasn't even conscious that I was really same sex attracted. Um, it really, although I had all the symptoms, the weaknesses of, of it, uh, the underlying, I would call it the underlying pathology that most of the guys that I now counsel, because I'm a professional counselor and have done this for a lot of years, but I didn't realize I had all that. When I hit seminary by that time, or by the time I was in late, late, maybe my senior year or starting uh, seminary in college, um, I started noticing a phys- real physical attraction to guys. Now, I had some to girls too, but I noticed it with guys. I was kind of enamored very much by certain guys and um 
And then what compounded it for me was I was, you know, and I hate to say it, but these were the, this was the seventies. It was pretty bad. Uh, but I would get hit on by guys in the seminary. I would get hit on by priests. And even though I never, you know, I, I never responded to it. I, I, I was shaken by it. And I thought, well, maybe I am this, maybe I'm a homosexual, maybe this is my identity and I'm just in denial, you know, so that, that, that was, that started stirring in my brain. Of course, I, I wasn't going to say that to anybody. (laughs) <laughs> because that, that must have caused such inner yeah. conflict, such well, it did. It must have been very difficult um, uh, to question your masculinity, to have come from an environment where your self-esteem was was low because you were measuring yourself perhaps against brothers and their ability to to do things that you saw as masculine um, uh, endeavors, the carpentry, the, the things that run the dairy farm in a way other than just the milking, which is still a very, you know, essential uh, um, role on the dairy farm. But, but it, for you to be making those benchmarks, to be measuring yourself, and then to have gotten to the seminary and to have these other experiences where you're noticing an attraction, it's surprising you, you don't know what to do with it, and then out of the blue you get hit on. Um, And that had to have caused uh, questioning um, and all sorts of emotions that would have been very challenging to deal with. Yeah, it it was. And, and of course, I, I didn't... I don't know how to explain it, but it wasn't like I was consciously um, thinking a lot of this stuff. A lot of it was uh, emotions that were under under the surface. I didn't know why I was depressed. I didn't know why I got so anxious. I didn't. Nothing made sense to me. Um, I just literally clung to the Lord because I did have a, um, a relationship with Him, and I think. And I and I knew what was right. My conscience. I had a good Catholic formation. There was no question about that. So I knew this. These other quote feelings weren't normal, and I certainly didn't want to act out on them. But I didn't know what to do with them either. Um, and I didn't realize that I had made some poor choices. Uh, uh, for example, and this is an example in the book where um, when I was a teenager. Um, my female cousin and I went to play ball at, at down the street with with a group of people in, in, at the rec department, and she was picked first to be on the team, and I was picked last. And I I that was so humiliating for me as a boy um, that I just made an inner vow that I will never do sports again. So I you know I just. I, I avoided the guys in the seminary who, um, and again, I wasn't even consciously avoiding them. I just knew I was, I was afraid if I, got, if I got close to them, they would see through me and reject me. And, and I felt sure. that one of the things, probably the biggest feeling people with same-sex attraction feel is a deep, deep shame. And I didn't want to, I tried to avoid that feeling at all costs. So I stayed away from those, from the more, Guys that really would have helped me the most, I, I just avoided them, you know. And I sure. clung to my academics, which I was very good in, in theology, I was very good in, you know. And 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 um, just I was nice. I was a nice guy. Again, this is part of the persona of a guy who struggles with same-sex attraction. They they learn how to. Um, um, they're they're so un, um, unsure of themselves, they, their identity, uh, and they want to be accepted so badly that they they kind of just try to learn to get along with everybody. I call it the people pleaser syndrome, um, and so that's what I was. I was a nice guy, nice seminarian, got along with, tried to get along with everybody, and that's kind of how I p- plowed through, you know. In the didn't want to make waves. <laughs> In the book, you use the phrase emotional deprivation disorder. Can you explain that and how it applied to you? 
Well, I, I had never heard that term before until I met um, Dr. Suzanne Bars. I think she's a doctor. Um, anyway, uh, and uh, she used that terminology. And as she explained it, it's, it's basically your, your need for being loved and loved unconditionally. Um, your emotional needs as a kid are just not met that they're when you need somebody there for you, they're just not there. And so you kind of learn to, um, to just stuff your feelings and, um, and you learn to, um, there, and, and, and it develops into a poor self image and, um, and so there, there's a, just a, basically a lack of af, a loving affirmation uh, that you, you grow up with. And, it, and, of course, we all need that loving affirmation. And it, it really uh, stunts our emotions and um, makes us feel bad about ourselves. And, um, and, and, of course, when you feel bad about yourself, you don't like other people. You judge people. Right. Um, and I had that type of an attitude. I judged everybody. I didn't say it out loud unless I, you know, and again, unless I gossiped about them, I would do that. I would do it behind people's back, which was a terrible fault. But, um, I would just, um, I would just keep, keep my, um, you know, I just didn't have that affirmation. And so I, I just went on and, um, and had this inner inner judgmental attitude toward everybody even in the seminary you know i felt that way you raise a real important point here in terms of fatherhood in terms of spiritual fatherhood um in terms of um this emotional deprivation disorder when we look at the, the statistics, I believe uh, there's been a 500% increase in the rate of fatherlessness in the United States since the advent of birth control. Mm. Um, wow. it, there's an enormous number, especially of young males, that are searching for that father figure and are not getting it in the home often because they're in a single-parent family, um, they're the product of divorce, uh, they have an emotionally distant father. Um, we've got a, a real epidemic of that in our country at this, at this time in our history. And yes. this need for spiritual fatherhood, the need for fatherhood coming from outside of what was the nuclear family, is becoming paramount and mm -hmm. you can't give what you don't have and yes. for the young men who are in formation and ready to assume the role of spiritual husbands and spiritual fathers if they haven't come to terms with what they don't have they're not going to be able to give it to those who are in need and then the cycle perpetuates itself the right. young men who are in need don't get what they need, and those who are hoping to be able to give it to them feel more and more inadequate and feel like they're failing in the role that they've been given by God. And mm -hmm. it is a downward spiral. Um, right. This book really is a, is a, will bridge that gap. Chapters like yours. Um, really highlight that. Right. Um, so here well, the, you are. Well, the, on, the, this whole idea of uh, the whole homosexual, for a guy, the whole essence of, of homosexual feelings uh, have to do with a sense of a lack of inner masculinity. So um, most boys grow up, you know, feeling they identify, even even sometimes in bad situations at home but there's about 25 percent of boys are born with a, a sensitive temperament uh versus a rough and tumble temperament well i right. you know most boys get through that uh, you know they they somehow their sensitivity doesn't overwhelm them but i was one of those 25 percent that's sensitive and there's there are statistics out there scientifically there's a great study uh, done on 30 
4,000 uh, teenagers back in the 90s in Minnesota, where they, 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 they found that 10 to, uh, children between the ages of 10 and 12, that 24% of them have an ambivalence about their gender or their sexuality at that age, which is okay. almost corresponds to the sensitive temperament. Sure. <laughs> so the ones who don't have a sensitive temperament, it's not an issue. But out of that 24%, only about 2% end up in the category of identifying, you know, with homosexuality. So um, anyway, I, I had, I got stuck because I did not identify at all with my dad. I was afraid of him. I rejected him. He was a pretty strict disciplinarian. There was not much affection shown. Um, and I, all my other brothers, I would say had a rough and tumble temperament. I did not. And I, it, I just rejected what I didn't know I was rejecting. I was rejecting masculinity, um, from him. For and them, so, it went off, off their backs like water on a duck's back. For yeah, you, with your yes, sensitive temperament, yes. every criticism, every yes. harsh word, every oh, lack I felt of it all land, deeply. Yeah. You felt it all deeply, and you were wounded. Right. And right. you arrive at the seminary, and you're carrying these in, major and wounds. I'm, yeah, and, and part of the wound is a lack of sense of masculine identity. I didn't even though I looked masculine, in a sense, I dressed masculine, you know, I, I, it, this is the strangest thing about same-sex attraction for a guy. You, and for a woman, it's, it's their femininity, but for a man, it's their masculinity. I did not feel masculine. I, and this is a very common phrase you hear uh, with guys who struggle. They feel like little boys. And that's exactly how I felt, a little boy inside, but you're a man. And... And so here I am moving toward ordination, <laughs> and I'm a little boy inside, and I don't even, I, I, I feel it, but I don't, I'm not even fully conscious that that's what I feel. I, nobody's, I've never had this conversation with anybody, but that's really what it turns out to be. I, I didn't feel like I could um, take on the responsibilities of a man, um, Right. but and so you just kind of cope the best you can. And, of course, that creates anxieties and depressions and loneliness and all the things that um, guys who struggle with same-sex attraction go through and carry into their life. And, of course, this has huge implications for um, if you're going to be a priest and you're supposed to be another, uh, you're supposed to be the bridegroom <laughs> for right. the church. You're supposed to be a, a mature man, a husband who can take care of the bride who feels like he can be a protector and a provider and a leader, and you don't feel that inside, oh, my gosh, you're, you're really setting yourself up for problems <laughs> because you will, not pers you will not project that to your people out in the parish. It, it, they see through you. I can see through it <laughs> with, with priests. I, with I'm just telling you, I can see through it. when I, I can pick, Because I've been there, I can pick out the guys who struggle. I, I can pick them out. Now, they may function, uh, they may, but I don't think they're the best role models for, for, for what the church needs <laughs> right now. Uh, strong, they need strong, manly priests. Clearly, you were able to come to grips with this. Was it through the help of others? How were you able to get beyond this? heal in the way that you needed to so that you could have accepted the Lord's invitation and the free choice to do either, to have gone on and been a good priest right. or to have gone on and accepted the role in this community and been a wonderful husband and father and grandfather. How did you, how did your conflict resolve? Well, the, the, my experience before I left seminary, I, I had spent a summer in this community, and the there was a natural um, the men. I mean, the men in this community were so strong, not just spiritually, but they were they were re I would call real men. <laughs> I don't know how to say it, and it was a little threatening to me, and and I thought, do I really? I really had to ask the question, do I really want to? I knew if I joined this community, 
And there was an awful lot of love, though. These men were full of God's love. And I thought, if I join this community, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to change because I can't just be who I was. I know I'm going to be challenged. It's like a little being in community is like being in a little pressure cooker. And these guys were very uh, seemed to be stable in their their identity as men, and and I wasn't. And I knew I was going to be challenged, but I. I just knew this is what I had to do if I was going to get healed. I had to sure. enter into a group of men and fully immerse myself into it without hiding. And to be honest, you just can't, it's, to even talk this way in the seminary would have been crazy. I mean, they wouldn't know what I was talking about. Um, what do you mean you want to be more masculine? We, you know, I, I mean, this wasn't a thing I was going to bring up or talk about in the seminary. At that point. I just knew I, right, at that point. I, and so um, when I entered this community, I, op, op, I chose to open up to my spiritual mentor here, and, and I just laid it all out. I said, look, at, I, I even said to him, you know, I think I might be homosexual. And he asked the question, he said, well, have you ever acted out on it? I said, No. He said, well, then you're not homosexual, which is true. He said, just, just, um, we'll, you know, just learn how to be one of the guys. Enter in fully into the life of the, guy, the, the men here, and you will, you'll begin to learn how to, you'll begin to get healed. And, um, and so I said, okay, <laughs> we'll do it. And... I just took the very, very mundane experiences that I had. Um, for ex- just an example, I, I didn't want to lead. I, I didn't. I wanted to be anonymous. And um, and my mentor, anytime he could, he would put me in a leadership position, a role where I had to make choices. Last thing I wanted to do was be confront- confrontational. I had to learn how to assert myself forced me into those positions. I allowed myself to, but he, 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 he gave me those opportunities and I had to confront people. I had to not be the nice guy. I had to take, you know, stands that weren't popular. Um, I had to learn how to correct somebody without going behind their back and gossiping about them. Um, and then I had, um, I had to learn how to um, take care of others. Like one of this, part of the problem is I had that, that little boy feeling. And, um, and you know when, little, when you feel like a little boy, you expect people to take care of you. Right. Well, learning how to come out of that persona and learning how to take care of others, that was huge. You know, and... So I had, I had, I had a, a point in my, uh, after I'd been there about a year, I was in a household, a Christian household with his family, and there were two other women in there. And one of the women came to me and said she didn't feel very protected by me. And I said, what are you talking about? What do you mean not protected? Well, she said, you just, you, you're too passive, and there was a 14-year-old boy in the home, the, the son of the family. And they, she said, I feel more protected by 14-year-old so-and-so than I do you. Oh, and boy, was like, that a, that, that was a huge punch. blow. But it was, it was God's mercy to me because I got with my spiritual mentor and I said, what does, he, what does she mean? She, I don't, she doesn't feel protected. Well, you could imagine if I gotten married. Uh, what a wife would have said to me. So right. I said, what does it mean? We, we must have taken a five walks around the block trying to figure out what that meant. And, and I began to learn. He began to teach me, you know, it means don't be passive. You know, if, if, if the faucet is leaking, don't wait for, your, for the w- woman to be browbeat you to go try to do something about it. I said, well, I don't know how to fix a leaky pipe. Well, then learn how to fix a leaky pipe. But don't just stand, sit there. Sure. Don't be passive. Don't, you can't do that anymore. You're, you're going to 
God's probably going to call you to marriage. And, if you, and you've got to learn how to be a, a man and, and be proactive and learn how to serve, you know, the women in your house, not just, you know, take a sit back and wait for somebody else to take care of it role. I, I couldn't do that anymore. So that, that's an example of how I had to learn how to be a man. But these were things I wasn't being, I, I didn't know how to be, nobody would challenge me that in, in, in seminary because the, in seminary back then, it, the theme was, I'm okay, you're okay, you don't tell me what to do, and I won't tell you what to do. And so everybody left each other alone, you know, it, there was no real challenge. And it sounds like timing was everything. Too. You mentioned the incident with the, the girl being picked for the team and you ending up being... If, if that word from that woman in the house had come to you too soon, too early, it could have just pushed you again like, yep, I'm, not, I'm certainly not a grown-up guy um, and yes. could have assaulted mm-hmm. your masculinity. You were ready to hear it at this point. What does that mean? What do I do to fix it? Um, right. You had grown to that level, but if that comment had come earlier, it could have been one more damaging blow. Sure. Uh, and, so and God's all, timing is everything. And man. part of all this is my pers- is my relationship with God. I'm, I'm right. growing in prayer. God is saying, you know, t- leading me. He's telling me, "Do you want to be an effective? Le- do you want to be an effective man, a disciple for me?" You know, and so he's God's challenging me in my prayer time as well. It's not like, um, and I wanted I wanted more than anything to be, you know, my when I met the Lord in a personal way when I was in high school, I told people I said my one goal is to be a saint, and so I that's always been my goal, and I and I want I wanted to do whatever God wanted me to do, and even if it was extremely uncomfortable. And had to make hard choices. Wow. Uh, so uh, the sports he is a. He put you through so much so that you would be was, able to help others. Uh, well, I didn't um, know that at the time. I had this. What exactly. I'm doing now, I had no idea I was going to be doing this at the time. And so another area, which is huge, and especially in the U.S., but it, it has to do with physicality and sports. You know, I. I had kind of rejected it, and, and of course most men are involved in that, or at least have an interest in sports if they can't play it. Well, I didn't have an interest in sports, and I didn't play sports, and so here I was in a community where every guy in the at the time when I joined, we had a softball league, and every man played in it, and we had about a dozen teams, and if I didn't join that team, I, it was like, I mean, I'm having to live through this trauma now of being picked last. And so right, I, right. I have a choice to make. And, 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 and so that, <laughs> that became my mantra, by the way. I had heard a talk of, by a Christian man say, the measure of a man is his right choices. And so I, be, I used to say that to myself oh, a thousand times a day. Even if I couldn't throw a ball, even if I couldn't fix a leaky pipe, the measure of my, my manhood was really making the right choice. I could do that. You know, I could make the right choice with the grace of God. So I made the choice that I was going to go into that baseball team. And, and I said, but I can't, I can't hardly throw a ball. I can't hardly hit a ball. So I asked, I took a chance. I asked one of the men who lived nearby. I said, would you go out to the ball field with me early every week to pr- to throw the ball and practice hitting because I'm not very good. He said, sure, let's do it. So I started gaining confidence. And before you know it, after two or three years, I, I was actually the, 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 the team captain making all the calls. I mean, I had improved so much. And then uh, as I, I use this example in my chapter, but we, we became the, the local uh, champions in the city. And I mean, I, you can't imagine how much that kind of stuff helps build your masculine confidence as a guy. That that kind of sure. thing. That's just an example. I use other examples in the book, but um, so anyway, um, that that led me eventually. Well, within well, I, I joined the community, and three years later, I was married. I, I had enough confidence that I could, because I'll be honest, this is the truth, 
I, the thought of getting married or having a family, having the confidence to raise a family, scared me to death. And, and that was indicative of what, I, I, again, I should have known that was a huge red flag. But I, I, so I don't think I would have made a really good priest if I had been ordained and not had all this stuff happen to me get he, to get healed. So I, I got married and, um, to a wonderful lady, <laughs> Marie, and um, she didn't even know all this stuff. I mean, w- this was stuff I worked through personally with my, my mentor. I mean, I, I just... We we got married, and of course we had the usual typical <laughs> issues, but um, she was a strong, uh, strong uh, Christian Catholic, and, I, and 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 as I was, and we we had the same vision for raising a family of little missionaries, and um, off we went, and 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 it was it was wonderful. Um, it, it, it's I almost. <laughs> I, I hate. I mean, I hate to say it, but I feel like I've lived such a wonderful, almost incredible existence. Uh, because from that, um, I began. My wife and I became very. Uh, we started to do a lot of leadership stuff in our community, and we were doing a lot of marriage counseling. And before you know it, I went back to school <clears throat> eventually to to get a counseling degree to just for the purpose of marriage counseling. And um, in the process, uh, about 20-some years ago, I went to a courage conference for youth leaders up in New York City, and and that's where I met Father Harvey, and uh, most notably, uh, actually Joe Joe Nicolosi. He was he was a Catholic um, person who was very well known in the circles of trying to help guys out of same-sex attraction. And he, he challenged me, he said, um, he challenged me to, when I finished my de- counseling degree, to, to start counseling, because I told him my story, and he said, you, God's calling you to, to be a counselor for these guys. It's, you're, you're, you've been healed, God desperately needs men like you who can help others in this area. So that's, that's kind of how I ended up um, putting out my shingle to begin to help guys, and, and I've helped you know almost for 20 years now just seen dozens and dozens and dozens of men and young and and boys and even clergy and in um working through this issue helping them to get healed you know wow you mention um there's so much i want to get into here uh and i'm hoping we'll have time i may have to have you come back for a part two um on page 188 you talk about you know two hallmark characteristics this lack of an internal sense of masculinity and we've touched upon that you also Mm -hmm. talk about an over emotional dependence on another man looking for love and acceptance Um, can you Mm -hmm. highlight that sure um so part of the issue for a guy who, who struggles with same-sex attraction is they never experienced full male affirmation, which is a universal, every, every guy, it's a, it's, we need it. You have to get affirmed from other men. It's part of, part of um, God's call to, to feel right. unconditional love from other men and to be accepted and affirmed by them. Well, if you don't have it, what begins to happen for a guy like like myself was I start looking for that Mr. I call it looking for Mr. Right. Now I wasn't looking for a sexual encounter, um, right. but I was looking for somebody that I could just open up and gush and open up all my needs, and they would see who I was and love me and accept me, and that we would be best friends forever and ever and ever. <laughs> that's probably the best way to put it. And I and I say in my chapter that it, it's really a form of spiritual idolatry because nobody can meet your needs. Even your, as a married man with my wife, she can't meet all my needs. God's the only person that can meet all your needs. And so um, most men, uh, um, they're not, again, they're not even aware 
consciously that this is going on. Um, it wasn't actually, I wasn't even aware fully. Um, I remember my spiritual mentor telling me I was emotionally too attached to one of the guys when I first came to this community. He said, I want you to spend less time there and start focusing on several of the other young men who you need to build relationships with. And I didn't understand. I mean, I just accepted that he was probably telling me the truth. I knew I spent an enormous amount of time with this one guy. Um, and it probably was not healthy for me. And it wasn't. And so I, 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 I spent less time with him and I developed other relationships. Most guys who come with this problem, who come to me, will, they, they are at a loss of how to build male friendships. Normal male fr- take yes. friendships. Yes, yes. They, they do not know. They, they look right in my face and say, how do you do it? I don't know how to do it. Because now they're 20-something years old. And, and, and see, this is something that happens naturally when you're a little kid, you develop these friendships with peers. Well, see, when, you're, when you struggle with same-sex attraction, you have trouble developing healthy peer friendships normally with boys. And so you don't, learn, and so you, you don't know how to do it. And, so, and, of course, most guys, they think you know, some kind of an intense mo- emotional sharing will, will make it happen. Well, I know women communicate more on that level. <laughs> But right. most guys do not relate to that type of an emotional experience, at least not at first. They have to right. spend time doing stuff together and just being together, uh, doing fun things together, sharing activities together, even if they don't talk at all about their emotions it, initially. Eventually, it starts happening. And, and this is what I have to tell guys. You've got to be patient. They say, well, that sounds very, they'll tell me, that sounds very superficial. I want something really, real, you know, where I can talk out my feelings. I said, well, you're never going to achieve what you want by doing that because right. most guys they'll will run the other way. They're going to they're gonna run the other way. If they feel you too clinging to them, too emotionally dependent, they're going to go the other way. And it's your fault. You're going to have to stop learning how to do that. And be patient and intentionally build friendships with the guys where there's a real mutuality that gets built. That's the other part of it that these, when you're looking for this Mr. Right, you, you're basically looking for some, you're putting somebody up on a pedestal. I was just going to say pedestal. Yes. Yeah. And they're, and they're going to come eventually because they're real they, people. Exactly. Once you really get to know them, they fall down. They come off the pedestal. And you and as I like to tell the guys, they you find out they've got BO just like you got BO. And then your 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 ideal guy is, is not what you thought it was. And um you know, so anyway, those are some of the things I work with on the guys, you know, when they when they come to me. And and these are things, you know, I've worked with, you know, uh, guys who are in seminary and and even talked to priests with these issues and, and these are the same things apply to, to all them as well, you know. You do an excellent job in this chapter weaving quotes from the Ratio Fundamentalis and demonstrating, you know, for formators how to deal with this issue within the context of the seminary successfully. Um, that there is a difference between this transient same sex attraction and deep-seated homosexual tendencies, mm-hmm. and that healing can occur. Healing is necessary for this seminary mm-hmm. candidate to, to become, to embrace celibacy, to embrace his role as spiritual um, father, spiritual husband, um, that he's got to be healed. But it can happen. Yes, um, that, and that's, that's my that testimony. You know? Yeah. And it can happen within the context of the seminary, too. Um, and the things that you're talking about here, about that relationship-building skills, that important, uh, you know, um, the importance of placing people in leadership roles that they feel uncomfortable with, but assuming that masculinity and doing what is necessary to support that sense of masculinity and help them grow into it. Um, is so very fundamental to, to who they are. Yeah. I, I think 
you know, I say in the book, I, I don't, I, I do think, you know, I would call myself a transient <laughs> same sex attraction. Uh, all, you know, I think somebody, we do make the distinction between transient and deep, deep seated homosexuality in, in the book or in the chapter. Um, but I do think, you know, I was just talking not too long ago to a vocation director in, in a diocese, and he said, he said to me, the majority of men, this is, this is what he told me, he's the majority of men coming to me are, have a history of, of homosexuality. Wow. And, um, and I'm, I've told, wow. no, it's not, this is a di- not my diet. This is a di- I'm just saying it's no, a no, diocese. No, his particular diocese. Yeah. yeah not not and, the um, diocese that you're in, but in his particular um, diocese, that's his experience. And, and so he said, and uh, he said, so it's a, he said, I'm not taking them um, because now, I mean, he might, he might take somebody who, who, who maybe has some, um, what, what I recommend to, 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 would recommend to, and what I recommend in this chapter is that if somebody comes to you who's, who's, who says, yes, I do have some same sex attraction, but I'm, I'm totally not into that. I don't want that. I, I really want to grow. I really feel called to the priesthood. I, my thing is, I think a, a good, they're not going to go anywhere. Uh, why not have them uh, give them a conditional, a couple of years, two to three years of intense, where they can get some intense help for this issue. Sure. Because they will then come into seminary much, much, much better prepared. And I really you know, having been in seminary and knowing the pressures that are on the guys to, you know, to perform, um, I don't, I think it's extremely hard to do it in seminary. I'm not saying it can't be done. If you had the right mentor, perhaps it could be. If it was really the, like you met with a weekly and it was, you had goals set and you were talking all this sure. stuff through, I think it could be done possibly, but I think it's a lot easier done before you come in than, and also, it, it kind of tests to see, is this guy serious about wanting help? You know, um, I, I think some of these guys, um, I think they say they, they don't, they're, I, I just think they play at this a little bit too much. I don't think they're serious enough to, to want to take, do what it takes to really become the kind of Oh, manly guy that <laughs> that imitates the, Jesus, who was very manly, you know. Right. And that's right. who they're supposed to imitate is Christ. You know, they're supposed to be other Christs, to, and that and and that includes his masculinity. If you if you're not imitating Christ, if you don't imitate his mas, you know, his masculine traits, which are, sure. you know, these this, you know, all the things we've been talking about, real love where you're totally self-sacrificing, putting other people first and, 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 and yourself last. Wow. There are so many questions I'd like to ask you, and we are getting very close to the end of our time. Um, if you had a single take-home nugget for, since we are Holy Apostles College and Seminary, and WCAT Radio is a is a production of, of Holy Apostles College and Seminary. Um, we have a fair number of seminarians, men in formation, uh, their formators, um, some of their bishops who listen to this program. If you had a single nugget for that particular audience, what would it be? Well, I think we're in a in a period of history in the church where this is a extremely critical issue. Um, and I don't know how well it's being addressed. Um, I do know that I just know <laughs> I'm not going to name names of bishops, even because I've had personal discussions who don't see this as an issue. Okay. They see, they, they, or maybe a seminary formator or a vocation director. They, their, their philosophy is, well, if they can just be celibate, then what's the big deal? That, that, okay. I've had that said to me. And 
And I don't think they realize that, first of all, um, you, you're in a, you're, in a sense, you're almost in an artificial environment in seminary where there's an awful lot of support while you're there. Right. But put this guy out in who, in who maybe is white knuckling celibacy, you know, right. but put this guy out in the field in a parish where he's by himself and all these emotions and, and feelings and issues that need didn't get addressed start coming up. And you're going to find somebody getting quickly addicted to pornography or back into pornography because all these guys struggle with male pornography. Going to raise um, that issue. That was one of the issues I was... Yeah. Um, yeah. And they're going to eventually be possible victims of, of, of succumbing be, to, to, to breaking their vows um, beyond pornography. So when if this I could just, be dealt with early on, they could be stellar yes, candidates. Please they don't give to the priesthood what they have, but they've got right. to be healed first. It it the deep, the iceberg is underneath. The tip of the iceberg is the sexual acting out. It's the underneath iceberg where all the issues are, and those have to be dealt with and healed. They need to be if he's going to be an effective, powerful, uh, life giving type of priest. I'm not saying a priest who doesn't have, who has these issues can't minister. I, I'm not saying he's, he's, he's somehow a, a less than a priest. I'm not saying that. I, I know there's a lot of priests out there who, who struggle, but I'm saying if they want to be to, fully <laughs> the kind of priest that God wants them to be, which is fully masculine, I'm convinced of that. Um, because <laughs> It, 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 that's part of our identity as men. Being masculine identity is part of who we are. And, and if it's hurting, if it's, not, if it's weak, then we're, we're not firing on all cylinders in our parishes. I'm, 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 I'll tell any priest that. They're not. They're not reaching the, some of the people they could be reaching. And with a flock that is as needy as it is now and will be, um, when we talk about the fatherlessness in, in America, um, when we talk about the lack of male role models, um, and just what it results in, you know, a higher suicide rate, a higher incarceration rate, um, fatherlessness is really uh, mm. robbing our youth yes. of, of their future in so many ways. And the priests are called to be spiritual fathers, um, to these men too, um, yes. and if In, they don't have that sense of their own identity and yes. they feel deeply, they can't be effective in what God's calling them to do. They may have heard the call; God may well, indeed be calling them, but until God, they are healed, they can't. And even e- even the men, even the men in the parish, a lot of them won't identify with the priest because they can see through this, and they'll have a. They may have. A lot of women following them. I don't. And that's not bad, but you want the men too in the parish to be right. to be called forth as fathers, you know, and leaders in the to parish. To inspire that fatherhood in yes, their own men, exactly. so that they can pick up their yes. role as they, husbands and fathers. And they do it need to be models of of men uh, who can lead, who have courage, who are totally self-sacrificing, who know how to protect and provide. This is what they need to model to their parishioners. Wow, absolutely fascinating, as is the entire book. This is one chapter in this book. The entire book, uh, 500 and some pages, um, is, is phenomenal. Spiritual Husbands, Spiritual Fathers, Priestly Formation, the 21st Century, edited uh, by Bishop Philippe Estevez and Bishop Andrew Cousins, published by Holy Apostles College and Seminaries and Route Media. Um, I know it's available on Amazon. It's also available through the Holy Apostles, uh, through the Unroute Books and Media website. Um, Dan, thank you so much for joining oh, me today. This so has been to a be terrific here conversation. Your chapter was very enlightening. I learned a lot through it. Thank you for sharing your very personal story um, on air here with the Vows, Vocations, and Promises Discerning the Call of Love audience. Um, uh, it's been my, my uh, privilege to have you here. Would you be so kind as to pray with us as we close the show? Sure. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. 
Heavenly Father, you are the source of all fatherhood. And I pray to you right now that we're in a crisis, Father, of fatherhood in in our nation. Um, And I just ask for the grace to be poured out on all our priests, our bishops, our seminarians, on all fathers, all natural fathers, or that they would courageously have the grace to, to take up the call to be the men that you want them to be. A real compliment, Lord, not, not, not authoritarian, but a real compliment to the women, Lord, so that your perfect plan for mankind can come about. I just thank you, Father, that you do love us unconditionally um, as sons and daughters. And I pray that uh, Mary would be, uh, Mary, I pray to you, Mary, that you would intercede for all these men to help them discover their, their true masculine vocation as fathers, um, whether they're priests or whether they're married, and that they could, in fact, uh, grow in purity and uh, purity and, and also purity of heart and love for you. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy name, through the intercession of Mary, our mother, and in the power of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost week. Amen. Thank you. Thank you again, Dan. Oh, thank you. Delighted. So happy. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece, and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.